Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of Advanced Topics. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be looking at Peterson's algorithm for mutual exclusion. So in the last video, we looked at hardware memory barriers and how we can use these to prevent the reordering of memory accesses that occur in hardware. Now, specifically, we were looking at modern x86 processors and the reordering of writes with later reads, and we showed how we could prevent this reordering using a hardware memory barrier that we inserted using an intrinsic. And this would allow us to have our store buffer drain and any pending writes in that store buffer become globally visible before any later reads in program order become globally visible. So what we're going to be looking at today is a bit more practical example of where we might use something like a hardware memory barrier. And for that, we'll be using the classical example for this kind of thing, which is Peterson's algorithm for mutual exclusion. Now, the reason why this uh, tends to be the classical example for this kind of thing is that Peterson's algorithm is fairly simple but it's often impossible to implement correctly on modern processors that have more relaxed memory models without using something like a hardware memory barrier. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started and we'll start by trying to understand the algorithm. We'll be focusing on Peterson's algorithm for two threads today, not the general case. So to start out, we have just two pieces of state to worry about. We have two flags, one for each thread. These flags say whether or not a thread or process is interested in entering the critical section. And then we have this variable turn here, which just says whose turn is it to enter the critical section. So how do we use these two pieces of state? So if a thread or process wants to enter the critical section, it first sets its flag to true. So P0 would set flag 0 to true, and P1 would set flag 1 to true. Next, our threads or processes yield priority to each other. So P0 would yield priority to P1 by setting turn equal to 1. And then P1 would do the opposite, right? So it sets turn equal to zero. Next, we have this busy waiting loop where our threads will wait to gain access to the critical section and be checking two pieces of state in the process. So what P0 is going to be checking is if P1 is interested in entering the critical section, so if flag one is true, and if it's P1's turn, so if turn is equal to one. If um, one of these is false or if they're both false, P0 can go ahead and enter the critical section. And likewise, P1 is going to be checking to see if P0 is interested in entering the critical section. And if it's P0's turn, and if either of those are false or they're both false, P1 can go ahead and enter the critical section. Now, whenever one of our threads or processes is done with the critical section, all it needs to do is set its own flag equal to false. So P0 um, would set flag zero to false, and P1 would set flag one equal to false, just saying um, this thread or process is no longer interested in being in the critical section and allow, say, the other thread or process uh, to continue into the critical section. Okay, so overall things are fairly simple. So where do we run into problems um, on modern processors that have more relaxed memory models? And why do we need something like a hardware memory barrier? So let's think about this in the context of modern x86 processors that are able to reorder writes and later reads to different locations. So let's start by taking a look at the different writes and reads that we have. So we have a write to flag zero for P0, then a write to turn, followed by a read of flag one and a read of turn. So we don't have to worry about these two writes being reordered. Right? We know from looking at the software developer manual in the last video that writes are, are not going to be reordered with respect to each other. So right to flag zero will become globally visible before the right to turn. And then we can also kind of discard the right to turn and this read of turn right here. So we have a right followed by a read, which can be reordered in modern, modern x86 processors, but it's a right followed by a read to the same location. And we know that um, those are not allowed to be reordered. So we'll always see this right to turn become globally visible before this read of turn right here. Okay, so this really only leaves us with this read of flag one right here. So how is this read of flag one being reordered and causing us problems? Well, let's consider a very simple scenario. So let's say that both of our threads or processes want to enter the critical section. We start out with both of our flags being false. Um, so the first thing that happens is say P0 writes up to flag zero saying it wants to enter the critical section and P1 does the same. Uh, but to flag one. 
but these don't become globally visible immediately. Let's say they get caught up in the store buffer. Next, we have a right to turn setting equal to one from P0 and a right to turn setting it to zero um, for, for P1. But these haven't become globally visible either. They're now inside of the store buffer sitting behind our right to flag zero and our right to flag one respectively. Right, so neither of our rights have become globally visible yet. What we have next is a read of flag one for P0 and a read of flag zero for P1. So what we have is two writes sitting inside of the store buffer, and then we have a read to a different location. Now, because these are writes followed by a read to a different location, it's possible for this read to become globally visible before these writes become globally visible on both of our threads or both of our processes. So what does that mean in terms of you know, functional correctness? Well, it's possible that both of our threads read the flag as being false, meaning they'll both immediately break out of this while loop and enter the critical section at the same time, right? And that's why um, this algorithm, despite it being so simple, is difficult to implement correctly on modern processors that have these more relaxed memory models and may reorder these memory accesses and hardware. Okay, so how do we get around this? Well, we have get around this, of course, using the same technique we looked at last video. We need to insert a hardware memory barrier to make sure these writes are drained out of our store buffer before these read can proceed and become globally visible. Okay, um, so now that we understand this, we understand the fix, uh, let's go ahead and take a look uh, and verify that this is a problem on modern x86 processors and prove that we can fix it. So let's start out by looking at our baseline, which will be this uh, peterson.cpp. So I've just implemented Peterson's algorithm as a simple class here. So we have our two pieces of state. We have our flag, which I've called interested. And um, I've marked it as volatile here to make sure it doesn't get cached in a register. Um, so if we, it ends up getting cached in a register and we update the contents of a register, that is outside the domain of cache coherence. So that update won't become globally visible. So the other thread or process won't be able to actually see that update, right? Which is no good. So we need to mark it as volatile here to keep it in memory and not inside of a register. Next, we have our turn variable, also marked as volatile for the same reason, um, which just says whose turn is it to enter the critical section. Then I've implemented two methods, a lock method and an unlock method. Our lock method is just where we mark that this thread is interested in entering the critical section, setting it equal to one, yielding priority to the other thread, and then our busy waiting loop, where we check to see whose turn is it, uh, whose turn it is, and if the other thread is interested in entering the critical section. And our unlock method is even more simple. We simply mark that this thread is no longer interested in entering the critical section. Okay. So what exactly are we going to be protecting with Peterson's algorithm today? Well, something very simple. We have a very simple work function that each thread is going to try and lock using Peterson's algorithm, increment some just normal integer, this value right here, and then unlock um, using Peterson's algorithm. And we're going to do this 200 million times, right? Um, because this is very timing dependent, it may take quite a few iterations um, to actually see this problem. So I've just increased the number of iterations up to 100 million um, for each thread, just to make sure that we, we can hopefully see it. Um, our main thread is pretty simple. All we do is initialize the value to zero, create our Peterson object, spawn our threads, wait for them to join, and print out the final value. So if our Peterson's algorithm implementation doesn't work correctly, so it doesn't provide mutual exclusion, then what will likely happen is we'll see a value less than 200 million. So each thread is doing 100 million increments, so we would expect 200 million. But if two threads enter the critical section at the same time, um, it's possible that their writes to the same location stomp on each other and um, some of the writes um, don't become apparent, right? It's possible for them to stomp on each other and us to see a smaller value than 200 million. Okay, so let's go ahead and quit out of here and prove that this is indeed a problem. So we'll compile peterson.cpp um, with O3 optimizations, link against libp thread, turn on um, mrch equals native, and then um, we'll just call the output Peterson. 
And I'll go ahead and do perf record so we can take a look at the assembly afterwards. And it takes a little bit, um, a little while to run since we're doing 200 million increments. Um, but what we end up seeing after this completes and we, we print out that final value is we get a result less than 200 million. So clearly these increments didn't, we didn't correctly provide mutual exclusion. Both of our threads occasionally enter the critical section at the same time and they're, they're right stomped on each other. So we missed some of those increments. So we only got a result of, you know, 199 million, 999,000, uh, 963. So we missed something like 37 of our increments. So let's take a look at our assembly just to check to see if it looks like it should be doing the right thing. So we'll go ahead and do perf report. And we see at the very top, we've got our, our two threads running that work function. So let's check uh, one of them. So here you see at the very top, we have our two writes. So we have a write saying that this thread is interested in entering the critical section, so a write to flag, followed by our write saying, um, they're yielding priority to the other threads, so in this case to thread one. So this must be thread zero. And then we have our, our, two, our, our two loads, right? So we have um, our, our read to flag and our read to turn right here going on. And if either of these are false, we go ahead and do our increment. So this is our increment of value. And then finally, we have our write, um, which is our unlock saying, we're no longer interested in being in the critical section. And if we check for, for the opposite, it looks pretty much the same, just slightly different. Um, because this is for thread one, you see it still marks its flag as true, saying it wants to enter the critical section, but now it yields priority um, to P0 or to thread zero here instead of to thread one. But the rest of the code is exactly the same, right? We have our two writes followed by our reads and, and, and testing of those conditions. If either of those are false, we do the increment and then um, we do our unlock, which is just writing to our flag saying we're no longer interested in being in the critical section. So nothing looks amiss in terms of our um, in terms of our generated assembly. So it is this reordering of writes with later reads that's causing a problem here. Um, so how do we go ahead and fix this? Well, like I said earlier, we fix this using a hardware memory barrier. So if we go back to this um, intrinsics guide, we're going to insert a memory barrier using this um, underscore mm underscore mfins intrinsic. So as a brief description of what it does, what this does is guarantee that every memory access that proceeds in program order the memory fence that we're inserting is globally visible before any memory instruction that follows the fence. So that means we're going to guarantee that all of our previous writes have become globally visible before the later reads become globally visible. So that means you know P0's write to flag zero will become globally visible before the read of flag one. And likewise with P1, the, um, the write to flag one will become globally visible before the read of flag zero. So we're gonna get rid of this reordering that's going on here. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look and, and see what that looks like in C++. So we'll go ahead and open up uh, Peterson hardware barrier.cpp. All of the code is exactly the same, except now between our writes and then our reads, I've just inserted this underscore mm infants intrinsic, and that'll insert that memory barrier where we need it. Uh, between these writes and these reads. Um, the rest of the code is exactly identical. So let's go ahead and compile this. So we'll compile Peterson hardware barrier, exact same flags, and I'll do perf record again so we can take a look at the assembly and see that nothing really has changed other than inserting that intrinsic. And we'll go ahead and run this and hopefully we'll see all 200 million increments. So we'll have hopefully solved our problem here. It takes a while to run, should be done, reasonably quickly though. And we see our final value is 200 million, right? So we're no longer having these writes step on each other. We're actually providing mutual exclusion now. Only one thread is getting into that critical section at a time. And if we go ahead and look at our, um, our final assembly here for either of these threads, we see that it's pretty much exactly the same. We have our two writes, but now we have an infants, right? This, this memory barrier before we have the reads of our conditions down here. And then finally, our increment 
and then our release of the lock or our um, writing to our flag saying we're no longer interested. And our other thread looks pretty much exactly the same. So we have a write to our flag and then a write to turn followed by this memory fence followed by these um, um, our, our reads that are going on. Okay, so that's going to go ahead and do it for this video. It's a simple example, um, but a bit more practical example of where we might use hardware memory barriers um, to prevent bugs and why it can be difficult sometimes uh, to implement algorithms correctly um, when we have processors that have these more relaxed memory models. So as always, you can find all this code on my GitHub page at github.com slash coffee before arch. So if we go under repositories and we go under um, miscellaneous code where this is kept um, at the moment, we have um, Peterson right here and you can find both implementations. So download this, play around with it. And of course, let me know if you have any questions. And as always, I'm Nick and I hope you have a nice day.